Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to the School of Radiance podcast. I'm your host, a humble human on a mission, here to help you both look and feel your best. In today's episode, we are going to be diving deep into the carnivore diet. Now, why is that? I've been doing the carnivore diet, not in an extreme way, for about nine months now. And the results that I've experienced both in my body composition, the way that I look, and the way that I feel, I would say are pretty much nothing short of remarkable. And today's episode is going to be focusing on just that topic. We're going to be talking about some of the myths, some of the stats, and some of the things that you might not have known before. Let me tell you a little bit about today's guest. We have Jason, who goes by Carnivore JT, and he's the driving force behind Savage Carnivore Company. With a Bachelor's of Science in Sports Medicine and a Master's of Science in Sports Administration, Jason brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the world of health and fitness. As a former college baseball player, Division I baseball coach, Jason understands the dedication and discipline required to excel in athletics. Transitioning into the realm of strength and conditioning, he honed his skills at the Division I level, shaping elite athletes to reach their peak performance. Jason's journey in fitness took a transformative turn when he delved into the world of bodybuilding, competing in the men's physique division and getting invaluable insights into nutrition and training methodologies. With over 10,000 in-person training sessions under his belt as a personal trainer, Jason has touched the lives of countless individuals, guiding them towards their fitness goals with unwavering dedication and expertise. As a fitness manager, he oversaw the well-being of thousands of clients and mentored hundreds of personal trainers, shaping the fitness landscape with his visionary leadership. But Jason's journey doesn't stop there. Embracing the carnivore diet two years ago, he experienced a profound transformation, shedding 35 pounds and reversing long-term health issues such as psoriasis, eczema, acne, joint inflammation, chronic GI issues, and sleep disturbances. His elevated mood and consistent energy levels stand as a testament to the life-changing power of the carnivore lifestyle. As the author of the Carnivorous Cookbook, what a great name, host of the Inner Carnivore Podcast, and founder-owner of the Savage Carnivore Company, Jason is on a mission to empower others to reclaim their health and vitality through the principles of the carnivore lifestyle. You can learn more about Jason and his work and his cookbook and products over at theinnercarnivore.com. Welcome, 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 Jason, to the show. How are you today? And of course... What is Radiance to you? I appreciate you having me. Uh, I'm doing really good. Uh, Radiance to me. Uh, Radiance is kind of, for lack of a better term, like an aura that people have. Um, It's something that you just notice from somebody, whether it's how they look, like radiance of skin, um, or just kind of the energy that they put off. Uh, When I think of Radiance, I just think of positive things happening, whether it's positives in your health or positives in your mood. Um, It's just a different feeling than somebody who comes in who's chronically sick or has low energy or isn't sleeping well or so that's I guess that would be what what radiance to me is. That's fantastic. I'm I've been sitting radiance kind of fell into it for the last 10 years. It's like, why do some people shine better? Why do they look better? Why are they more of a pleasure to be around? I'm more of a pleasure to be around also. And I look better with following the carnivore diet that I started about nine months ago. I still have carbohydrates and things like that. I don't do anything in uh, extremes, but I would love for you to just kind of share with everybody who might be hearing about the carnivore diet for really the first time. What is it and what can it do to the body? So carnivore on the surface is, it's essentially an an elimination diet, right? Like everybody loves to tout it as that. It's an extreme elimination diet, which is true. Um, But essentially what it is, it's getting rid of everything that your body may negatively have an impact with. Um, And quite often that's carbohydrates. Now, why is it carbohydrates? Um, A lot of it's because most carbohydrates are going to come from processed foods. And 
I, I think it's pretty apparent to most people that the more you process a food, the less nutritional benefit you're going to get out of it. Then you factor in the fact that really today's even fruits and vegetables are not, I don't want to use the term natural, um, but everything's been selectively bred to be bigger, sweeter, produce more. Uh, that's literally how farmers pick their seeds for corn, right? It's actually super fascinating if you go watch um, information on how farmers select their seeds. It's literally based on what's going to be the biggest yield um, because at the end of the day, they're a business and they have to make money and margins are super tight for farmers. So the, the nutritional value of our food is just incredibly declined even over the last 50, 60 years. So carnivore aims to eliminate that as much as possible. Um, meat based, it's, it's essentially animal based foods. Um, people might get confused with the animal based diet, which is animal based plus things like fruits and honey and, and maple syrup and that kind of stuff, which a lot of people have great success with. Um, I don't have a problem with that diet whatsoever, but people have a weird, everybody thinks as soon as I get rid of processed foods, as soon as I start exercising, I'm going to feel better. And that happens, but it's very hard to explain why people, when they go carnivore, get all these extra benefits and all of these autoimmune issues and all these inflammatory issues that start to resolve themselves uh, to a point that it's hard to overlook. Like you, you can't, you can no longer just turn a blind eye to the things that carnivore is able to achieve. Um, and I think there's a lot of people who are on one side, they're trying to give explanations as to why that happened. And on the other side, there are people who are trying to explain why, yeah, you might feel better now, but it's going to kill you in 10 years. Yeah, I hear you on that. I was actually curious to see what was going on with my cholesterol levels, maybe about four months in. And my labs were so good, my doctor called me back. <laughs> because I was like, you know, I want to check out the thyroid, just make sure that everything's on point, yearly exam kind of deal. And I, he was like, wow, your, your labs are fantastic. This, this, is, this is working for you. Um, HDLs were a little bit elevated. However, that's also like the good cholesterol. And when we think about cholesterol... We have to remember that for hormones, and if you want to look great, you want to age well, you want your body and your mind to function properly, you need to have hormones. And the precursor for making hormones is the good cholesterol, the HDL. So I wanted to just kind of talk about that a little bit. You said something that I'm totally aligned with, Jason, getting rid of what the body doesn't want. And one of my whole sort of like values and something I take a stand for is purification purification, whether that's oxidative stress status, inflammation, what we eat, what we listen to, what we spend our time and energy on, who we're around in our daily lives, what we're doing for work, coming from a pure intention of, of serving others, and then you'll be served in return. But this purity approach, also with faith too, and I see you're wearing a cross. I didn't wear mine today, but I typically do. These are massive parts of radiant. So I'm glad that you kind of brought that in a way sort of full circle that the more pure you are, then the better you're going to look and the better you're going to feel because your body isn't dealing with other things like carbohydrates that are going to kind of put like a wrench in the machinery, if you will. And I do want to talk about the fact that I actually think the carnivore diet is more economical. What are your thoughts on that? It absolutely is. Um, and I've, I've shown that in several videos um, that I do, and, and granted, the better quality meats that would be ideal are going to be more expensive. But when you start removing all the extra stuff, like you remove the condiments, you remove the sauces, you remove, you know, all these additives to it, you realize that it's actually a lot cheaper, right? Like, and so, you know, everybody wants to fight over it, like, I'll post what I eat in a day and I'll post how much it is and everybody will, you know, that's not true. You can't do that. That's from 10 years ago. Um, but like anything, you have to be mindful, right? I saw, I'm, I'm from uh, the Pacific Northwest and I saw somebody post a picture of a price of an organic pepper 
that was four dollars each which are highly inflammatory and i was like and you're not getting anything out of a pepper right like yeah sure there's some vitamins and minerals in it but you're not you know, how many calories are in a pepper it's mostly water so that's like an accessory food right you're not surviving off peppers but it's four dollars a pepper i was like that's absurd i can go buy ground beef for 2.97 a pound so do i buy a pound of ground beef or do i buy one organic pepper and it's i mean so when you when you look at it that way when you look at the fact that i'm not adding a ton of stuff to my meals really quickly you find out that you can eat significantly cheaper carnivore versus even a whole foods you know mediterranean or however you want to base it type diet yeah it's really interesting now here's the thing i kind of fell into the carnivore diet <laughs> i would say out of convenience and I love to cook. I've always loved cooking. Um, my family and my sister, you know, total foodies, if you will. But I just found that, you know, when I buy a whole chicken from the butcher, I have some steaks in the fridge, some ground beef. I'll do, I'll literally just cook that, eggs, cottage cheese, and it saves me a ton of time. And I just started to notice that I was feeling better. And then the body composition, it was, it was kind of like, like a slow burn, if you will. And then I feel like at the four or five month mark, and especially say now over the last month, so month eight, I had just so much energy to finally get back to the gym again after being into pretty rough car crashes that really set me back for the last few years with working out. And so that's why here on the show, I'm talking about exercise and I'm talking about nutrition a little bit more because I focus so much on biohacking and skincare and longevity and the research around that and the practices around that. But we really have to also just get back to the basics of nutrition and exercise, really the essentials and the foundations for having a beautiful, healthy body that's going to carry you through life. So honestly, I just kind of fell into it. I'm like, this is easy. I feel fantastic. I feel like I'm giving my body what it wants and I'm going to roll with it. So I stopped buying crackers. I stopped buying bread, uh, all these different sauces. I used to do rice with it, but now it's like, I don't even have rice anymore. Forget about potatoes. But when you mentioned peppers, those are really high in oxalates as well. So a lot of the vegetables and people kind of look at me sideways when I go to a restaurant and I order a steak cooked in butter with salt. <laughs> I actually learned that move from my uh, friend Dave Asprey when we were out for a you know professional meeting, and I saw him order that way. I'm, like, I'm going to do that. So it's just like steak or a burger patty a la carte. And people, when you're in a social setting, will, will look at you a little bit weird. Like, where's the vegetables? Don't you need any veggies? And be like, works for me. And I used to be that girl that was having just these massive salads for lunch and for dinner. It would take me like an hour to eat it. I wasn't full and I was puffy. I was easily about probably 10 pounds heavier and now I'm lean and shredded and tons of energy. So it does work for me. Now, what are some of the, I know people have like the, the, the ethical hiccup around eating meat, but I would say to that, that humans have survived on meat for a really long time. These agricultural practices for genetically modifying the, the soil genetically modifying the seeds and the crops for high yields. I just wrote a paper on nutrition and the skin for a UK journal not too long ago. And I felt like a conspiracy theorist while I was writing that paper with what I found. And because of the soil degradation that's happened, that's why our, our vegetables and fruits have less nutrients to them and actually more toxins to them. So to live a more pure lifestyle for me, that is actually eating meat. And I'm all, always grateful for the beautiful animal that I'm consuming and it's perpetuating my life and, and what I'm here to do and my purpose. Share with us some of the research and statistics on why the carnivore diet is better than we've been told. So I think everybody gets hung up with this idea of factory farming, which I don't think anybody will tell you is good for anybody, right? Like it's not good for the animal's health. It's not, you know, it's a profit driven 
large conglomerate monopoly, for lack of a better term. Um, and I think that's a big problem here in the United States. Uh, uh, most meat is controlled by a couple large companies. Um, people throw the ter term around big beef, like it's actually like a thing, right? There's a few large corporations that do most of the meat um, that are subsidized by the government. And it's all profit driven. And so then you end up with poor living conditions for animals, um, poor feed and not as good of a product. Now it's, it's difficult in our current food system to transfer that to a more of a, a small farm dynamic. Does that need to happen in order for this to get resolved? Absolutely. How does that happen without just blowing up our entire food supply? That's, you could probably do an entire podcast just on that. But I think when you look at stuff like regenerative farming, yeah, it's difficult because it's expensive. Um, it's expensive for the farm. It's expensive for the consumer. But when you look at regenerative farming as compared to, let, let's go the vegan route, like the complete opposite, right? If we were to just eat plants, the current monocropping system that we have in place is absolutely horrible for the soil. Um, you deplete the soil of so many nutrients by just consistently running a single crop through it. Uh, and again, that's the nature of the, you know, the world that we live in. People for generations, for thousands and thousands of years have understood the benefits of rotating crops. Like that's, like, that's not a new concept, but that's not how today's agriculture works. So you have this, we're growing these plants is terrible, right? You're releasing billions of pounds of pesticides onto these crops every year. You know, anybody that wants to argue the dose makes the poison, it gets into your food. Like, and I don't think we should be okay with glyphosate being on any of our food. Like that's just- Or in skincare as well. I mean, it's, it's in there too. It's not okay. <laughs> like, I don't care what the dose is. That's not okay. It's Roundup weed killer, right? It's not okay to put some of it on your food. So you, you have this big issue and it's just absolutely destroying the soil. Whereas if you actually look at the process of a regenerative farm, it is so much better for the soil to have a cow act as your natural lawnmower. It helps, you know, bring carbon out of the air, recycle it through the soil. And you, you end up with this, a much healthier environment and an animal that's much happier. Like that's, that's what that animal is here for, right? Graze, live its life, roaming around, and then it becomes food. Like that's just the life cycle of an animal. Uh, and so when you look at it that way, when you look at the limited amount of harm on other animals in a regenerative agriculture environment, as opposed to monocropping where you're killing billions of animals, right? Um, you, if you want a, an interesting statistic, look up how many insects are killed for um, farming crops. Like it is billions upon billions. And then you look at all the, the field animals, the mice, the squirrels, the rabbits, all of that that happen. And then you start to realize that our current practices are not better for anybody. It's not better for our food. It's not better for the environment. It's not better like our world. You now, whether you want to say we evolved or we're created, it's designed to be self-sufficient and having animals helping the soil, helping pull carbon out of the air, helping it get into the soil. It, that's the way it's supposed to work. So, you know, from a logistic standpoint, could we feed an entire country on regenerative agriculture farms? No, probably not. But there are definitely practices that we could implement where we could go back to a, you know, a scenario where animals are free roaming. You know, 60% of the livestock um, pasture is non arable, which means you can't grow crops in it anyway. So I, I definitely think if you blew up the food system, you could get back to um, a, a way of eating that prioritized animal proteins, worked in better fruits and vegetables with you know less contamination from how they're grown. But I, I don't think it's possible in our current society, right? Like it's just, 
so heavily monopolized um, in a capitalistic manner that it's just, yeah, you do what you can, right? And I honestly, truly believe that eating meat is better for everybody involved than focusing on a, a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. And I just really want to clarify something here. I don't do anything to an extreme. I don't think that that's healthy. I don't think that's a good way to go through life. So say, for example, I want to have something that isn't carnivore. I'm going to have it, but I primarily make really good life decisions in regards to especially like food and what I do for fun and things like that, like 90 to 99% of the time. Moderation is also a huge part of that. Uh, so I, I did want to mention that. Now, the next question is, yes, we know food is grown in a certain way. Agricultural practices are done to yield more crop. Okay. But the, the issue with what happens to us when we have that uptake of all those different toxins like glyphosate and in Europe, they, they ban glyphosates, right? Yeah. yeah. And like, why is that? Why is there more regulation on something like that in Europe than there is here in North America? Well, you mentioned capitalism and North America is very much driven on consumerism. So I, I'm just going to say this very frankly, but the more dumb you are, <laughs> the more toxic you are, the worst, you know, you're not going to make as good decisions. You're probably going to be buying stuff you don't need that actually is like fast fashion and like smart technology that isn't going to make you more smart either, by the way, those Bluetooth headsets, you might be listening to this one, please stop using those you're basically microwaving your brain, by the way, go into your microwave, lift up that glass plate, and you'll see that the symbol on that is actually a radiation symbol, just some food for thought there, no pun intended. But we have to think about these things. It's like, how can we live our best lives, make the biggest impact on our family, do what we're here to do, live our purpose and live it well by both looking and feeling our best. It's going to come from having a clear mind and a very beautifully, highly functioning body. One of the things that I have observed in vegans and vegetarians over the years since offering rejuvenation since 2011 is they tend to have this grayish skin and they also tend to age more rapidly. They also tend to not get the most out of their rejuvenation as well. And this is just an observation that I've made. I can pretty much tell when I meet with someone if they are a vegan or vegetarian and that's because they're missing out on protein and collagen. And in my coffee here, scoop of protein, 20 grams of protein, scoop of collagen, 10 grams of collagen, and another scoop of collagen, which, which is another 10 grams of collagen. And I'm telling you that the skin benefits from protein and collagen are remarkable. I'm turning 38 this week and People always tell me that I look younger, I feel great, I have great energy levels. So all these things work. And I've kind of like see, observed people that sort of live these different lifestyles and sort of taken pieces from them. And, you know, what is that? And that's what the School of Radiance is all about. What do you see, especially in the fitness side of things, the training side of things, those who are vegans and vegetarians, what are their energy levels like? What is their muscle like and what is their skin like? Oh, I love these. Uh, so my name alone brings out vegans, right? Um, I think it's testament to the human body, how we are able to adapt and utilize pretty much any food source. Because um, I, I won't deny it. You can find vegans that are 50 that look like they're 30. You can find vegans that are jacked. Uh, one of the, uh, I will butcher his name, but um, Patrick, blah, 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 blah. It's a very long name, um, is a world champion um, strongman, vegan. Uh, you have vegan bodybuilders, you have vegan athletes. It can be done, right? The human body is, is extremely good at extracting what nutrients it needs. Um, from a variety of food sources. However, when you take a, the majority of people, 
you have to be very, very conscious of what you're eating on a vegan diet in order to get enough, namely because of bioavailability, right? Um, it's actually, I like to compare it to like, so like a panda bear, right? Everybody thinks a panda bear is just sitting there eating bamboo. Panda bears actually aren't herbivores. Panda bears are carnivores, but because of their environment over, you know, their evolution or, you know, whatever you want to call it, they have adapted to being able to survive off of bamboo, but they don't process it very well. They don't digest it very well, which means they have to constantly eat in order to get what they want, which is why they eat. I think I saw something crazy, like 10 hours and 20 hours a day. Like they eat a crazy amount because they have to, right? That's an example of a, of a carnivore who is able to continue its species and, I don't know if you can consider a panda bear thriving, but, you know, surviving with a completely different diet than what it was, you know, originally had. And so I think humans can do it. However, if you just take a standard vegan diet and say, hey, just eat a bunch of plants, don't track anything, don't worry about what you're getting, just eat. You are going to see these things that you're talking about. You're going to see it in the skin. You often see paleness, right? Like there's a reason there's a stereotype for vegans, right? It's smaller, less muscle mass, paler, less energy. And it's because it's not as readily available. And if you are not super conscious about what you're eating, you're probably going to have these deficiencies. Um, it also comes in that, you know, 99% of vegans have to supplement with vitamin B12. You're just not getting it from plant sources. Now you take that to a somebody on the carnivore, let's go to the other extreme. A lot less thought has to be put into it, right? Because I am getting so much bioavailable nutrients that I don't have to be super conscious about the different types of food I'm eating because of all of this stuff that's available. And as you start to remove, you know, as you said, these toxins that you're eating, you realize that your body is able to synthesize all of these vitamins and minerals and nutrients a lot better. And so it leads people to this, well, how do you do that without vitamin C? How do you do that without supplementing vitamin K1 or vitamin E or magnesium or potassium? Like, how do you get those? They never like the explanation. But at the end of the day, you have all of these carnivores who are not showing any signs of these deficiencies, who will take these blood tests and not be deficient whatsoever. And so then it leads you to believe that there's some underlying process. Um, and I actually uh, heard a great explanation. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Dr. Ben Bickman. He's a, yeah, he's fantastic. If anybody doesn't follow him, you have to go follow him right now. Uh, he has a PhD in bioenergetics. He runs a lab where he literally grows fat cells. Like it's a lab on metabolism. And his explanation was, as you eat more collagen, your need for vitamin C goes down incredibly. And I'm like, okay, like that makes sense because I don't know a whole lot of carnivores that supplement vitamin C and we're able to do just fine and not get scurvy from the very little bit of vitamin C that's in animal foods. So I think when you start comparing them, yeah, you can, you can look healthy, you can feel healthy, you can be healthy eating pretty much anything. But for the vast majority of people, if you just eat species appropriate foods that are bioavailable to us, um, in the long run, I think you'll just be a lot healthier. Yeah, these are all really great uh, things that you mentioned. Love the, the field of bioenergetics and the human bio field, actually. Dr. Beverly Rubick, she's one of my favorite researchers on this topic. And it's sort of like that ethereal glow. The human biofield is, is this invisible field around us. Um, we can measure that with technology, a little different than the aura, like when you think of like someone's aura. Um, but I, I do feel like I definitely glow better and brighter on the carnivore diet here. Now, what, what I do want to talk about here is the importance of taking a bio-individualistic approach. This is the whole purpose of my paper that I wrote last year. 
because everyone has different blood types, everyone has different DNA, the expression of the DNA, which is the study of epigenetics. That's why there's these various gut tests that are available, like the Viome gut test, for example, on my biohacking page, that can give you some specific readouts as to what your body can process really well or maybe not so well at this time. I am a fan of that. I've done a couple of rounds of that. Also tested my biological age and it was nine years younger. Woohoo! Excited to do that one again and see what it is now after the carnivore. But you'll never hear me say this diet is good for everybody. I honestly just fell into the carnivore diet simply because of the convenience. And then something happened. In, I swear, something happened in my brain where I would see food, have food choices, be out at a restaurant, be like, I don't want to eat that because there's no nutrient value to that. If I'm going to be you know, getting a meal out or something like that, I want it to have nutrients to it. So I'm going to go straight for the steak kind of situation or the salmon. So this shift that was in my brain, and I feel like it, it was just my body saying, continue to eat nutrient-dense food. And it is kind of weird when you start to eat more carnivore based and then you experience that and then you see the results and then you just keep perpetuating it. But again, I kind of fell into it because I didn't have to meal plan anymore. I didn't have to spend a ton of time preparing food. And I do think it's a more cost effective and nutrient dense approach with the results to back it up. I want to talk about an experiment I did last week. <laughs> I found a really great store. I've known about this store for a long time. They have a lot of local game meat. They have a freezer section, really great meat options. I live on a small island, Vancouver Island. Uh, so there's a lot of like hunters here. Uh, the pandas don't really have to hunt. So the time that they would have spent hunting, they spend foraging and they have to spend a lot more time foraging. And hence, that's actually a great example of why um, focusing on plants is not as time and energy effective and also the time it takes and the energy it takes to, to break that stuff down. So I was in the freezer section and I found some organic grass-fed, grass-finished beef liver. So I bought a pack of it, came home, fried it up in some grass-fed butter. I went to the grocery store the other day and one of the guys working there was like, oh, are you buttering someone up? Because I bought like three packs of butter. They were on sale. It was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm actually buttering up my liver tonight. It was really funny. And it's so like, I cooked a whole pack of liver. This was enough for probably four people. If you were to like portion size it based on like the palm of your hand situation and then put some uh, Redmond salt on it ate it. It was kind of like chewy pate. It was a little different, but I do like pate, but it was still palatable. And I wanted to do this purist approach. And this was very much an experiment. I finished the whole plate. Then I was getting ready to go in the sauna and I was like, whoa, I feel like I could go for a run. I could put on a bikini. I could go to the beach. I could have a second dinner. And I just ate an entire plate of liver. And then the next day, because I started to go to the gym again after injuries, I went to the gym in the AM. I played pickleball with my girlfriends in the afternoon. And then I had enough energy to go to the gym again. And that was really, that was something to notice, just how light I felt, just how satisfied I felt. But I wasn't heavy. And now this is, I think, a difference between different types of meat that you are going to consume. So say, for example, if I eat chicken or if I eat steak or a ground beef, I feel a little bit heavier because of the nature of the, the muscle fiber in the body breaking that down and ingesting that compared to, say, sardines, salmon, eggs, cottage cheese, but liver I actually felt the best with. Now, is this something that you've noticed as well in your journey of of uh, being a carnivore? Uh, I've noticed it with red meat in general. <clears throat> so that's another thing that often keeps people on carnivore is you talk to somebody who's anti-carnivore, um, especially vegans, and you talk about bloating and they're like, I never bloat. And I'm like, no, you just don't know that you 
never bloat, right? It is so common practice in our society. It's the stretchy pants at Hello or at uh, Thanksgiving, right? Like we joke about, you know, I got to unbutton my top button. It is so common to have this feeling of fullness and bloating, right? Like don't swim 30 minutes after eating. I don't want to eat too soon, you know, before I go play or I go, you know, do an activity or whatever it is because it's so common. And then when you, not everybody, but most people, when they go carnivore, they, they have this realization like you did where you eat and you're like, I could literally go do anything right now. I could go run. I could, I don't feel heavy. I don't, you know, I'm not really hungry anymore, but I'm not stuffed. I don't, this is weird. I don't want to take a nap right now. I don't, what is going on? And that's when you realize that that is how you're supposed to feel after you eat. You are not supposed to feel bloated. You're not supposed to feel lethargic. You're not supposed to feel tired. You know, five hour energy made an entire product based on the 3 p.m. crash, right? Hey, you're going to have this 3 p. You know, you get back from lunch, you, you start to get tired. You have this little five hour energy and you keep going. No, you're not supposed to feel like that. Like you were not designed to feel, to, you know, run out of gas halfway through the day and feel tired after eating. Like that's, that's just not how it's supposed to be. And so when you actually feel that, um, for me, it's just red meat in general, whether it's a steak, whether it's, you know, I can eat a pound of ribeye and pop up and be like, I'm good to go. Like, let's go. And when you realize that you're like, okay, maybe something's going on with this other food that I'm eating that's causing me to feel this way. And so honestly, a lot of people stay on carnivore strictly for that fact that food no longer disrupts their daily routine. Yeah, it's really interesting. There's no more food coma, <laughs> but you will get some, you know, sideways glances at the dinner table when you're with your family or out socially. Uh, but then people are going to look at you and be like, whoa, okay, that's clearly working for you. <laughs> Maybe I'll give it a go, right? So there's something that's really interesting that happens on the carnivore diet. Now, I'm a nurse. I don't get grossed out easily. I know it's not, you know, the most desirable topic to talk about, elimination. But what's interesting on the carnivore diet is that you actually have fewer bowel movements. Why is that, Jason? So it, this goes along with the fiber, right? The number of people that ask me if I'm constipated or leave comments, or how do you poop? I, I honestly, so I'm a little bit sarcastic. Um, I can be a little bit of a smart ASS. Um, so I honestly, I just respond with, well, the same way you do. Like it's pretty normal. But I think once you realize, so I'm actually not as anti-fiber as most carnivores are. I'm very anti thinking that you need fiber. So it is of my opinion that fiber is necessary when A, eating carbohydrates, um, because that's just how they're found in nature, right? Outside of honey and maple syrup, there are not a whole lot of pure carbohydrate sources that don't also contain fiber. Um, you can say sugar is natural, but actually the stock on sugar cane is very fibrous. So we literally strip that fiber away to get to the sugar. Fruits, vegetables, all these carbohydrates have fiber with them. I think carbohydrates need fiber in order to lower the glycemic load that they place on the body and help shuttle this digestion. When you remove that, when you remove eating, for lack of a better term, toxic crap from your diet, <clears throat> you drastically reduce and or eliminate the need for fiber. And so what you end up having is you have this, you're eating this nutrient dense bioavailable foods that gets almost completely digested and it minimizes the amount of waste that you have. And so I think when people start to realize that for anybody who follows like carnivore Ray, he just did his little experiment where he added back in a little bit of fruits and vegetables. 
And that was his main thing. He's like, I went from going once a day on carnivore to going three, four, five times a day, adding just in a little bit of fruit and vegetables. And you, you, you start to regulate, right? And the less waste that you have to get rid of, the less you're going to have to go. That, that would seem to be common sense. People tend to not view it that way. They're like, well, what abrasive, I've, I've gotten this one. What abrasive substance are you eating to help cleanse your colon? I was like, why would I need to cleanse it if it's not dirty? <laughs> like, I don't need to eat a wire brush, you know, to clean out my intestines if I don't have a bunch of crap to clean out. Like, that's, it doesn't sound very scientific, but like, what, what are we doing here? I don't understand. So yeah, it, it's very common for people to go less frequently, um, but to have just better and more regular and smoother bowel movements because we're not forcing our body to get rid of all of this indigestible lack of bioavailable food. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'd rather not see money that I'm spending on food go down the drain, to put it lightly. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the impact of doing this on my cycle and my hormones. I don't get cramps. You know, I can notice when the emotions are kind of coming up, a little bit heightened, things like that. But I actually use that to my advantage to feel more. I don't have sugar food cravings or anything like that. And I don't have bloating. I kid you not. One of my girlfriends, she's like, Rachel, you got to share like the more real raw side of things. There's this, there's this other sort of biohacking uh, female influencer. And she posts all the time how bloated she is at different times in the month. I have no bloat. It's, it's so great. Like I don't go through these, these body fluctuations that I used to, like I was at the gym yesterday and like abs shredded, lower abs shredded, low back pain, what low back pain, what brain fog. Like I feel like myself more throughout the month than I did before, which is great. Uh, so I just wanted to share that for the ladies that that's just kind of something I've observed. And also for the guys too, like if your partner starts eating carnivore, she might be a more pleasant woman to be around for that entire month uh, compared to uh, other experiences you may have had where you had to like show up with like flowers and chocolates, a heating pad or a water bottle and give extra cuddles, things like that. It's just really interesting. These uh, things that I've noticed. So no, I don't share those bloating pictures of my, my stomach because I actually don't get it. And actually bloating, because I've looked at parasitology over the years and basically wrote a paper on oxidative stress and its impacts on skin aging, biggest contributor, contributors are going to be toxins in your air, water, lighting, electromagnetics, your foods, and pathogens that can also toxins, heavy metals, parasites, yeast, candida, all those things. And so if you are actually are experiencing things like bloating, that can actually be a sign of parasites as per parasitologists who say that 80% of North Americans have parasites. So I do want to talk about this for a hot second because I actually don't eat raw anymore. I used to have a ton of local raw salmon. I'm also from the Pacific Northwest as well. So local caught wild salmon is like a big part of our lifestyle here. And I used to do that a lot. Um, I might've drank river water far too many times on my off grid days out in nature, in the wilderness, doing my cold plunges in the river because the water ain't warm here, everybody. Yeah, so definitely picked up some things, but clearing those out, doing the biohacking, adding in the carnivore, situation. Like I just see it in myself. I look fantastic. And you probably won't believe me when I say this, but I literally eat pizza three to four times a week after, after the gym, but the pizza is a cauliflower crust base. And then I just load it up with chicken, ground beef, ground venison, you know, three eggs on top of that, some cottage cheese. Like this is a hefty high protein meal with some of the carbohydrates. And if you look at carbohydrates on the label, you're going to see fiber under there as well. So getting some of that too. Um, but yeah, I eat pizza three or four times a week instead of salads for lunch and dinner every day. And I'm the leanest. I'm the most shredded. I'm the strongest I ever, I ever am. 
the the important piece here that I do want to touch on, um, and then we'll wrap up here, Jason, is sarcopenia for women. Women lose muscle as they age. So the sooner you put on as much muscle as you can, the better you're going to age, the better you're going to bounce back after having kids because you have a really strong abdominal wall. What have you seen with women as they age and their muscle mass and things like sarcopenia? So there, there's a couple studies out there and it's a little, I'm, I'm sure somebody will come back and be like, oh, no, 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 that's not. It is of my personal opinion that the combination of muscle mass and VO2 max are the single greatest predictors of longevity, bar none. Um, and no, that does not mean the more muscle mass that you have total, the longer you'll live. Like we can all look to bodybuilders, right? Who are having these short lifespans. So obviously there's a point, right? There's a point where, you know, me doing a whole bunch of, you know, abusing a whole bunch of illicit drugs in order to get muscle mass is not going to help my longevity, right? Like <laughs> given my platform, I have to paraphrase and I have to like put in little asterisks on literally everything I say. So, but from a standpoint of you want to increase your longevity, you got to have muscle, right? It, it, it's so important for so many things um, from just a healthy metabolism alone right? Like muscles, the driving force of this increased metabolism. And so I think when people focus on that, you get these absolutely amazing results. Not only do you look better, but you feel better and you're going to live longer. Um, and sarcopenia is, I forget the exact definitions. I want to say for a guy, it's arms under 12 inches. It's like neck under you know, 13 inches or whatever it is. There, there's certain guidelines, but you can tell when somebody has sarcopenia, they look frail. Um, that's not somebody who's setting themselves up for long-term success, being able to, you know, handle any issues that you have as far as like a chronic illness or even an acute injury. Muscle is just so protective in all of those. Um, and it's especially for women, right? For men, it's a, that's like a, a cultural thing, right? Like, having muscle is almost a status symbol, right? Like they didn't do, you know, back in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, they didn't do these statues of, you know, super fat emperors. They did statues of the gods, right? Who all looked like gods. And it also shows high testosterone too. Right, exactly. That's so a good like, thing. It's it's super easy for a guy to understand why muscle is important. Um, it's a little bit not as pushed from a society standpoint for women, which is why I think it's even more important for them to focus on it. Um, just there's honestly no negative to building muscle, like none whatsoever. The only negative is going to be if you're so obsessed with it that it starts to ruin your life or you start taking stuff or your workout too much, which most people, that's not an issue, right? Like it's, it's rather, it's not as common to see somebody where you have to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa slow down. Like you're doing a little too much. So I think if women, especially if they focused on building muscle, the amount of things that would fall into place from that, from everything, from how they look to how they feel, to how they sleep, to their mental, you know, clarity, to psychologically, right? As you start to build muscle, you feel better about yourself, right? Um, it's just... I never just loved my dumb. body more than I do now. Like I love my body more now than when I was doing personal training two, three times a week when I was doing fitness shoots. I love my body now. Like I, I look the best I've ever looked. And I'm in my late thirties compared to my early twenties when I was eating the wrong foods, had more bloat, didn't have this body composition I have now. Uh, the other thing here is ladies, I'm telling you, if you start to eat carnivore and you cook carnivore food for your man, he will probably love you just a little bit more. <laughs> Your kids are also probably going to just have better sustained energy throughout the day. Like instead of giving them cereal, instead of giving them oats for breakfast, give them eggs, give them steak, give them meat. They're going to be doing better in school. So 
play around with this a little bit. And, you know, if, if you are, are in a relationship and a partnership, say to your man, we're going to be having surf and turf and it's only going to be protein. I guarantee you that's going to make him super happy. Then you're going to feel great. He's going to feel great. Hormones are going to be better, better, better com- body composition. Life is better. Life is better when we look better and we feel better. And um, it's, it, it is about using your own discernment these days with what we're being told to do. Because a lot of these fat diets that kind of come out, they're heavily driven by a surplus of agricultural crops that need to get sold off. We actually saw this with seed oils after World War II because uh, cottonseed was used to create motor oil for all of the machinery. Then after the war, there was a surplus of that crop. Guess what happened? Oh, we can fry chicken in this now. And now we're just seeing an explosion of rates of obesity, I've published in my research that deaths of unknown cause, which is autoimmune conditions or someone passing before they have a diagnosis, these are doubling in Canada year over year. I kid you not. Doubled in 2019 compared to the data set from six years prior to that, it doubled again in 2022. So this is the importance of doing everything you can to be as pure as possible, reduce oxidative stress. You're going to look better. You're going to feel better. And you might just end up being a little bit happier and have the energy that you need to do to live your life's purpose and be better in your family and relationships and those you connect with. Thank you so much, Jason, for being here on the show. I'd love to have you back as well uh, because the nutrition and the fitness side of things are so important. I'd love to do a follow-up with fitness on you as well and because I haven't focused enough on that, to be totally honest here on the show. I've been focusing a little bit more on beauty, but this stuff makes you more attractive. It makes you more beautiful. When your body composition is on point and you have energy to show up as your best version. Jason, I'd love for you to share with everybody where they can find you, where they can find your cookbooks and the different services that you provide as well. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you having me on. Um, so everything on social media is at carnivore JT. Uh, luckily there are not a whole lot of people with even remotely close to names. So even if you put that into Google, um, I'm on pretty much every social media platform. I stay pretty active on all of them. Instagram's probably the one I'm most active on. Uh, my website is the inner carnivore.com. Uh, you can find all of my stuff there, all of merchandise, coaching programs. Uh, I sell knives as well. Um, you can also, that's the name of the podcast, the inner carnivore podcast. Um, just finished up season one of that, taking a few weeks break, um, to kind of deal with the insanity of, of everything that's going on. And then I'll be picking that back up again. Um, but yeah, it's carnivore JT is the easiest way. Uh, the inner carnivore.com is to get a little more information. Fantastic. And I have to say your social profile is actually one of my go-tos for recipes and inspiration because you can get like a little bit bored when you're eating meat all the time. You do need to kind of mix it up a little bit. Um, But just before we conclude here, cook your meat in grass-fed butter or ghee or coconut oil. Those are going to be, I think, the three best things to cook with as opposed to, you know, other different oils. And in a cast iron pan, season your own pan. Forget about the aluminum and Teflon cookware. That stuff is terrible. Those pans are going to last you forever. And they're really easy to take care of if you haven't used cast iron yet. It's definitely the way to go, in my opinion. Love what you're doing. Love what you're sharing. Really appreciate and value your time. Have a lot of respect for what you're putting out there and how you're doing it as well in a very, you know, educated, no nonsense way, just cut to the chase, really high value stuff you're putting out there. So thanks for what you're doing. And thanks everybody for tuning in to the School of Radiance podcast. Check out the description of this episode for more information on how you can connect with Carnivore JT, aka Jason, and also myself as well to support you on your skin and rejuvenation journey with limited exclusive one-on-one sessions available, tutorials, and membership and of course great products pre-vetted by me and my products are coming soon and they're non-gmo everybody using some pretty cool technology i'm actually even without preservatives and some of them using some colloidal silver 
a little bit of a nugget there. I love you all so much. Have a great high vibe rest of your day. And I will see you again right here on the School of Radiance podcast.